Today, we're uh, continuing our uh, Alaska Climate Modeling Program or Arctic Climate Modeling Program uh, mentor lecture series. This is the third one this year, and we're lucky enough today to have John Lingus be our presenter. And he is a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and he's worked for the National Weather Service here in Fairbanks for the past 26 years. And today he's going to be doing a, uh, a presentation on weather balloons and the observations you can, you can get from them. Take it away. All right. Thank you. It's good to be here this afternoon and uh, glad to have this time with you. <clears throat> I'm going to be alternating between a PowerPoint presentation and just the face view here of myself. And uh, I think after I'm done with this, then there'll be question and answer time. Um, so I guess we'll get started. If we can switch to the PowerPoint. Thank you. Okay, hopefully it's all coming up on your screen there. So I'm going to talk today about observations from weather balloons. In the past, uh, several mentor lectures, You've had various folks, Dr. Cahill, Dr. Atkinson, talk about some uh, various types of instruments. And we're going to talk about uh, one instrument, basically, today uh, that's attached to the weather balloons as they go up in the atmosphere. There are three parts to this type of uh, setup or this system. Uh, I say, start out by saying weather balloons. Uh, what we call them in our own uh, lingo here with the Weather Service and uh, perhaps in the research and academic community, community is radio sound observations. And you don't have to be too worried about that big long name right now. Uh, hopefully we'll, through the course of this presentation it will become uh, obvious. But there's three parts to this system. The first is the balloon that you see there at the top. And attached to the balloon, uh, or the string from the balloon, there is a parachute, which we'll describe a little bit later. It's very difficult to see. I have a, an actual system here uh, with me in the room that we'll cut over to here in a little while. And the third part is what's called the radio sonde, hence that's why we call it a radio sonde observation. This is the device that takes the measurements that we, uh, creates the data that we use. These observations are taken twice a day. The balloons are launched around the two o'clock hour from all the various weather offices and I have a map of all the different places they go up in Alaska here in a few moments. One of the things I want to emphasize here is that these types of observations do not just occur in Alaska, they don't just occur over the United States, but these observations are going on at the same time all across the planet, worldwide. It takes about 90 or so minutes, somewhere between 80 and 100 minutes, for a flight, that is the ascent of the balloon and the instrument, to be completed. The data that we collect is really only done during the time that the balloon is going up. So what does this radio sonde measure? I have a little ruler here next to the radio sonde, and I have an actual one with me here I'll show you. But it's about seven inches high, about four inches wide. Uh, one of the important things it measures is temperature. As it goes up into the atmosphere, it records the temperature. At the same time, it's also recording the humidity of the atmosphere and it's marking the pressure too, each pressure level as it goes by. It, it's noting the value of the pressure at that altitude. It's also measuring the wind. It's not like there's a little wind instrument attached to this, but there is a way that it does measure wind given um, what we know about the balloon and how it ascends to the atmosphere. We can calculate the wind direction and wind speed. And there is a little antenna at the bottom. You can see that hopefully dark blue or maybe it looks black to you. Um, little appendage there uh, sticking out of the bottom of the box. That's the antenna for a battery operated radio transmitter. And that's how we get the data. There's a little transmitter in there that's run by a battery so that as the balloon ascends with the radio sonde, the 
the data the radio silence collected is sent back instantly uh, out of this box to a receiver. Where do we launch these? Well, a variety of places. We launch them in Barrow, Kotzebue, Nome has a facility there. Our weather office in Nome launches these balloons. There's weather offices again in Barrow, Cottsview, Fairbanks, McGrath, Bethel, King Salmon, St. Paul, Cold Bay, Kodiak, Anchorage, Yakutat, Juneau, and Annette. So it's quite spread out over the state. If you compare this to a plot of where they're launched in the lower 48, you'll find that the places are quite a bit closer to each other than they are in Alaska. So here's the balloon being inflated. The folks who inflate these balloons put helium in the balloon and they um, measure the balloon with the weight there when it's uh, filled up to their satisfaction so they know how much helium is in the balloon. That helps them calculate how fast the balloon will go up. And that's important in finally determining the wind speed. Well, I talked about there's a transmitter in the radio sound that sends the data, but that data's got to be collected. That signal's got to be collected, and here's where it is. Each of those 14 sites I just showed you on that map have a tracking antenna sitting atop what we call an inflation building. The inflation building is where the balloon is inflated, and the, all the, the entire radio sound and parachute is assembled with the balloon. But the antenna is up on the top and that receives the signal from the radio sawn as it goes up into the atmosphere. You see the one large door in front of you that's opened up to release the balloon, but if the winds are really strong blowing into the building or into that door, there's a door on the opposite side that can be opened up and the balloon launched from there because you don't want the balloon or the radio sawn hitting any objects on its way up. So launching into the wind or when the wind is, is blowing into the building is not a good thing. That's why you have two doors. So, how far up? As you go up in the atmosphere, the air pressure overall decreases with height. This is something you've probably have learned uh, or may have learned already in your schooling. And so as the pressure decreases with height, there's still this certain amount of helium that's in that balloon. And that tends to help stretch the balloon bigger and bigger. So it keeps on slowly expanding as it goes up. At a certain point, the balloon can no longer expand and so it bursts. And that's usually around 50,000 feet or so. If if the balloon is uh, a really good quality and there's no defects. At that point, the receiver on the ground detects the burst, the receiver that you saw on top of that building, and the system that collects the data then turns off the receiving the data from the transmitter. Now the reason you do that is because it's collecting the data as a radio sound falls would be pretty worthless because the radio sound is falling much faster than it's ascending. Therefore, it's not really all those instruments on it, temperature and humidity and pressure are changing um, or the instruments are not not sensing how fast the temperature and humidity and pressure are changing as the radio sound falls. So the data isn't really uh, worthwhile. So it's only on the ascent or the rising that we want to collect the data. Well, once it starts falling, a red parachute opens up. That's that red dot you saw on the slide early on. And it slows down the radio sound and the balloon's descent to Earth because we don't want this system of balloon and radio sawn to come falling down and bonking someone on their head. 
The radio sonde overall is pretty light. The heaviest part of the radio sonde is in the battery. But the radio sonde, the parachute, the balloon reached the ground many miles from where they launched. Basically because as the balloon ascends, it's carried to certain directions by the atmospheric winds that are occurring. And if the winds are light, the radio sonde system doesn't go very far, but it goes a ways because it's traveling for 90 minutes, an hour and a half. If the winds are very strong, then it travels a long ways. And it's really rare for people to find the radio sondes. Uh, once in a while, they come across one as they're trekking around the wilderness. Uh, we do not make any effort to retrieve the radio sondes. That is, we don't send people out to go look for these instruments. We are pretty much done with the instruments in the immediate term once the, they stop sending the data. But we have designed the system in a way that we can recycle them to the best possible uh, effort and in the most efficient means at the least cost. For one, the parachute and the balloon do um, uh, break down. They are biodegradable. And the radio saws themselves come inside this box. There's a little package. I've got it unfolded there, as you see in the picture. Uh, it's a package that the radio sonde itself can be slipped into and then sealed up. And it's got a, a pre-address label. So it's sent to a facility in Kansas City, Missouri, where weather service people take apart these used radio sondes and then recycle the components, like the temperature sensor, humidity sensor, pressure sensor, those type of things. So you can just unfold the package, drop the sawn in it, and you can place it in any U.S. mailbox. It'll get there. This is kind of look at the data. I think uh, what we might do now is break uh, from the PowerPoint, and I'll actually show you this uh, live here. Okay. So, I don't know if we can, can we zoom in any more perhaps? Let me zoom in on this one. Okay, so this is the this is the radio song here, and you can see it's not uh, not too big. This is very light; it's without the battery, so it would weigh oh maybe half a pound altogether with the battery, I believe. Uh, right now, it only probably weighs about an ounce or two. So the attached to the radio song is the parachute and this is in plastic it's uh, bright orange so you can see it when it comes down and uh, if we avoid you can move out of the way if you see it coming towards you uh, but again this is just plastic it's attached to the radio saw and I've shortened the entire length of strings on all these parts because uh, they're really the strings are, are usually about uh, five times longer between between these parts. So that's the parachute. And here's the balloon. So the balloon starts out, this is where you fill the air in. It's uh, It's got a very stiff cup around here to go over the spout that uh, shoots the helium into it. And then it's tied off here. And this is the balloon here in an unflated mode. And I'll just, I don't think I can really give you the full sense of the size of the <laughs> balloon. But that's kind of what it looks like. Now, I told you, though, that this material does stretch as it goes up into the atmosphere. So this balloon gets very, very big. Um, it can uh, reach probably the size of a small classroom, for instance, by the time it gets up to 50,000 feet, because this is very stretchy material, at least to a point. OK. Well, now I can go back to the lesson here. I talked about uh, the balloon or the radio sonde picks up data on its ascent into the atmosphere. You know, I think it was the last mentor lecture I gave uh, about a year ago, and I talked about data types. And one of the data types I covered was data in the table. And this is an example of data in the table. Uh, this is the radio sonde information. And you don't have to 
try to decipher all these numbers, but I've just got it in a, in a table. On the far left is uh, the pressure, and then the second far left column, so that's going down, is pressure. First of all, the, the lowest or the highest pressure that is near the surface, near the ground, is at the top. So as we go down these columns, we're going further up in the atmosphere, which is not really uh, easy to understand. But I've got a picture instead of this data that will probably be easier to look at in a second. Second column is the height that's computed as how high up in the atmosphere the balloon was at a certain point. Then it takes a temperature reading. This is all in Celsius. That's why the C is there under temp. And so there's a variety of temperature readings. This is an observation that was taken on the 6th <coughs> excuse me, of December uh, at 12Z. There's that 12Z time there. That's in Greenwich Mean Time. So that was at the 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock hour that this radio sun run was made. And the next, uh, the fourth column is the dew point. That's really kind of a measure. It's a temperature that indicates humidity level. And then the fifth column is actually the computed relative humidity, starting with 74% at the ground, dropping to 59, 57, 53, and so on. And there's uh, mixing ratios, another humidity variable. That's in the sixth column there. You see it's grams over kilograms. We won't, won't really touch on that at all. Um, here in this talk. And the last two columns are the calculated wind speed. First of all, the direction of the wind um, at the ground. It was basically zero means uh, actually due north. And uh, so it was out of the north at 11 knots. All the wind values are in knots. Temperature values are in Celsius. Uh, so this is just an example. But Looking at it in a graphical format, well, first of all, I want to talk about how the wind is plotted. Uh, it's usually t plotted as an aerotype symbol of direction and speed. So whereas the plot I'm going to show you eventually is going to be of, of height versus temperature or height versus wind, um, the height versus temperature portion is just basically temperature versus height. To, two different values that create one data point. But with wind, we're plotting a direction and a speed. So the shaft of the arrow points to the direction the wind is blowing toward. For instance, southeast. This is where the, the back is to the front is headed southeast. So you might think you would call it a southeast wind, but we call it the direction the wind is coming from. So we would say that this is a northwest wind. Now that's just a direction. But let's look at the speeds. Wind speed is added to the direction shaft by using little barbs or perpendicular lines. So the barbs can only show speed in five or ten knot increments. And a five knot bar, which is shown in example A there, is half length. And a ten knot bar, shown in example B, is full length. So uh, for higher speeds, that is above uh, 45 knots, each 50 knots is displayed in a different type of symbol called what we call a flag. And barbs are always pointed on the left as you look toward the front of the wind shaft. So here's an example there. Five knots for the very short barb, ten knots for the one full barb. And this one, which is two longs and one short, I'll give you just a few seconds to be thinking about it. You can talk among yourselves there in your classroom. 25 knots. And the answer is 25 knots. Here's another one. Oh, look at all those barbs. My goodness. And the answer is 45 knots. And finally, there's one with those flags, or a flag, a long barb and a short barb. 
The answer is 65 knots. Well, this is the plotted data. And the graph is a little bit more complicated than I would have liked. Uh, I pulled this off the internet at the uh, same time this data table I created from the sounding. Uh, so it's also at 3 a.m. on the morning of December 6, the radio song from launched out of the GNOME office. The first thing I want to point out is that in the vertical scale, we have start with 1,000 at the bottom, going all the way up to 100 in those blue markings. That is decreasing pressure or decreasing height. The actual height values are in black, kind of right off to the left there, or excuse me, to the right of the pressure values. The height values are very difficult to read, but just the only thing that's important is that the pressure in, uh, is decreasing with height, and um, so the height scale is going up as you, as you go from the bottom of the chart to the top. Then the second thing that's important is the, on the horizontal scale, there's temperature. And temperature goes from really cold values of minus 80 all the way up to, uh, on this chart, it goes up to minus 40. But the observed values are the two solid black lines. The first line on the left is the, oh, excuse me, the first line on the right <laughs> is the temperature. The thick black line on the right is the temperature and how temperature changes with height. And the thick black line on the left is the dew point or a, um, an indication of humidity. And finally, on the far right, we have wind direction and wind speed. And if you look carefully, there's those wind bars we were just studying. Well, what can we learn from a plot like this? There is uh, a lot of different lo local analysis you can perform. And I'll just point out here, we're not going to touch base on these in any way in depth, but just the purple and green background lines help discover how stable or unstable the air is as you go up. And this is important at various times of the year or in various circumstances. But we're not going to uh, delve into that right now. Well. A couple of things we can learn from this plot is one is where the temperature line and the dew point line are far apart, you can usually think that the atmosphere is dry. Where they're close together, you can assume that the atmosphere is moist and there could be a cloud at that level or there could be cloud layers through uh, a deep portion of the atmosphere as I kind of pointed out there. One thing, too, you notice about the winds is that they change direction with height. In the first half, as you go from the bottom up, the winds are out of the east. And as you go from the middle part, or actually they switched in the middle to about a south wind. And all the way further on up, they stay kind of south or southwest. That was a local perspective, but a regional perspective is when we plot these different values for one pressure level on a chart of Alaska, or the, uh, as well as the surrounding area. And uh, either humans or computer models can analyze uh, pressure fields with this, or height fields is what we usually do. And this is a height field taken at oh, about 18,000 feet up in the atmosphere. And you can see that uh, South, due south of Alaska, there's, it don't have an L place there, I should have, but you see that numeral 5040, uh, that's the lowest pressure nearby, in, or in that region, so that's a low pressure area, and there's one further off in the far, far western uh, Aleutian chain, another low pressure. But basically what I just want to give you the feel for um, is that you can plot various data or analyze various data with this over a large scale when you have a number of different radioson information points. Satellites also help to analyze over the ocean where there's no radiosons because there's no land, there's no facilities there to launch a radioson. Once in a while there may be a ship that does that, but, but it's pretty rare. Most of the 
time, or almost always, radio sondes are launched from uh, land. Another thing on regional analysis, it helps us find, again, where the pressure systems, how they're changing with time, the movement, getting colder, getting warmer. We can find out uh, whether these pressure systems are getting stronger or weaker, and that helps us determine how the weather is going to change where you and I live. Especially where clouds or precipitation may move in or out of an area. Then there's the global perspective. And this chart looks really complicated and messy, but take my word for it, Alaska is right where the AK is. It's hard to see. But this radio sun data from across the world, because I told you earlier that these observations are taken worldwide, this goes into analysis uh, procedure where the whole hemisphere is analyzed at various heights. And that helps uh, to in the production of forecast charts. Once the data is launched, it's formatted and transmitted to a weather service computer just outside Washington, D.C. This powerful computer system takes about an hour or so to create a set of charts of weather patterns for the future. Anywhere from 48 hours to 240 hours in advance. And we call this computer modeling. So the current data helps us to to take a look at the future. This is just an example and it's pretty busy but just um, there's a couple of different fields on here. One there's a, a constant height field there's also some wind barbs you can see there and there's colorization of another field uh, there. So you can put a lot of information on a chart and often we as meteorologists look at several different parameters on one chart. So even though uh, we receive so many charts, a forecaster on any one day is likely only looking at a small set of charts that he or she feels are important. Uh, maybe there's a basic set of weather charts they look at no matter what the weather is like and the rest is charts that depend on the um, current situation of the day. Where is the problems going to be at? What charts do I need to look at? And they'll zero in on those. Nonetheless, the radio sound data is still looked at daily in its basic or raw form along with satellite and ground data. And finally, it's this actual data that enables the forecaster to decide how well the forecast charts are treating the current weather features. So the radio sound data helps us to get a handle on what's happening now so that we can hopefully make uh, accurate guesses on and predictions on what's happening in the future. And that is the presentation. First we had a question from uh, Ken Stenick and he wanted to know uh, about uh, troughs and weather patterns related to them. He says they see them on PBS and they're not really sure what they are. Well troughs are an area of lower pressure in the atmosphere. So these are, are regions where typically if you have lower pressure uh, you will have motion, air motion that is trying to rise up through the atmosphere. So where the air is rising and it can rise up a sufficient amount of height the uh, moisture in it will condense and you'll get cloud formation and eventually precipitation. And usually uh, troughs are also associated with maybe a bit tighter wind fields. So you tend to get more of the inclement weather when a trough is approaching and is moving through. We also have another question and uh, some of the students want to know why you were interested in studying the atmosphere. Hmm. <laughs> it's a pretty broad question. Yeah. I am perhaps uh, one of the odd, uh, odd ducks in the meteorology field. Um, it seems like a lot of people who get interested in meteorology do so when they're very young. They're your age or they're even younger. And uh, such was not the case with me. Uh, I certainly saw uh, weather um, parts on uh, TV shows growing up watching the news. Uh, it wasn't until college days in my, my first year in college that I just took an introductory 
class to weather. And I really liked what I learned. And I also uh, realized that the background that I had at that time in all the courses I had taken and in uh, the first part of that year, freshman year in college, as well as the high school preparation, um, suited me pretty well for continuing to study on in meteorology. At the school I went to, uh, it was called Atmospheric Science, but it's all one and the same. So I started out to ending that freshman year uh, choosing Atmospheric Science. And I kept on with it, and it's been really a fascinating field. One of the interesting things about studying Atmospheric Science is every day is different. There's no drudgery. Uh, students want to know if John knows Delano Barr, who is a retired uh, National Weather Service employee, formerly from Kotzebue, and he's now living in Shishmaref. Right, yes, I knew Delano during my uh, early years here. Uh, I believe he retired uh, oh, six or seven years ago. I can't quite uh, uh, place the exact time, but yes, I've been out to Kotzebue on occasion. Uh, I, I know um, maybe it was my first trip out there. Well, I finally got out there in, in my present uh, role, and uh, which allows me to travel more. And I met Delano for the first time then, and uh, he uh, it was really a great uh, pleasure to meet him. Excellent. What is your your current role in the uh, with the National Weather Service? Well, it's uh, part of uh, a the Weather Service, I should say, is is a organization that is science-based and also service-based. So we try and apply the science of meteorology in a way that provides service to the people of the United States. The National Weather Service is a, a, uh, an agency under one of the larger ag agencies of the federal government. And so our main mission is service. It's to protect people's lives and help minimize property damage. So my job is at one of one which occurs in each office across the nation of the 120 forecast offices. Each of them have a position called the Warning Coordination Meteorologist. That's the official title. Don't try to memorize it. It's a long one. But basically, when I talk about science and service in the Weather Service, this position, Warning Coordination Meteorologist, covers the service side of the National Weather Service. And there's another position, um, in fact you'll hear from him in a couple months, Eric, uh, who you also heard last year, and his position focuses on the science side, helping to find new things about the science of meteorology in ways that can be practically applied on the forecast desk. So these two positions together help the weather service will become stronger in its mission of science and service. My, uh, specifically speaking, uh, my job requires going out and talking to various people about the weather service, making sure in particular that people who make emergency decisions, like emergency management folks, have the weather that they need to make their decisions. They know where to go, and we have the phone numbers and fax numbers and and they have the websites for so that they can get everything they need when they need it to make important decisions that will help them um, preserve their lives of the folks in their community and minimize property damage a couple of uh, months ago we had Kathy Cahill in here and she said that the favorite part of her job was she got to blow things up uh, what's what's the most fun <laughs> thing about your job well I think the most fun thing is getting out and meeting people and talking to them. Um, it, it gives me a charge just to be out and visiting places and talking about the weather service or learning from folks there what is important weather to them because not necessarily what's important to people in uh, Seattle are the same things that are important to people in uh, Diomede, for instance. Uh, so. It's very interesting to go from village to village and city to city to find out what are the important weather needs and seeing if our basic forecasts and warnings can help to accommodate 
those needs that people have to a certain degree. Since we are uh, with the federal government, we have a, a responsibility to serve everyone to a fairly equal extent, so we can't be necessarily writing highly detailed and specific forecasts for just one person in any one location. But it is important to know overall in a village or in a city what weather is really important, makes a difference uh, to people. So it sounds like you do a lot of uh, traveling on your job? Do you, do you travel a lot? There is a fair amount of travel involved. It's not as frequent as I would like to be. We have to uh, manage uh, resources. There's also um, other, th other uh, responsibilities I have in the office to make sure that assisting the manager of the office with procedural things so that our forecasters um, are up to date on, on the newest ways to do things, um, new assignments, new projects. And also, it, as you all know, it costs a lot of money to travel around Alaska, so I can't be out hopping around the state every week. Um, I usually try to make one trip each year to each of these regions, the Nome area, Kotzebue area, and Barrow area. Uh, and I'm still, you know, our responsibility starts at the Alaska Range and goes all the way north to Barrow, east to Canada, and west to the Bering Strait. So there's a lot of territory, even inland, that I have yet to really visit. So there's still plenty of work to do. We had some questions about um, what type of schooling you, you went to to become a meteorologist. Did, was it just a, a bachelor's degree? Yes, my degree is, is a bachelor's degree. You can get master's degree and, of course, PhDs as well in meteorology and still work for the Weather Service. Um, the basic courses, which may be also what this question is alluding to, are um, that I had to cover in, uh, in, in college, especially the first two years, a lot of math, that is math with calculus, and then differential equations. So if you like math, or if you're good at math at least, um, that'll help you uh, to get your bachelor's degree in meteorology. And then you have to take courses like physics, that is the physics that comes with the advanced math that I just mentioned. Um, there are other physics courses that don't use that type of math, but you have to use the math, that you have to use the, take the physics that uses the higher math. And uh, so math and physics are a large, large component of, uh, of the meteorology degree. And can, uh, do you know much about the meteor meteorology program at UAF? Is there? Well, uh, my understanding is that it's mostly a graduate degree. They have not formed a, a full undergraduate uh, degree yet. Uh, that is something that the the group there, Atmospheric Sciences Group, that works under the physics department is, is striving towards. Uh, when that will be accomplished, I don't know. So it may be very difficult to get a, um, a completely uh, a bachelor's degree in meteorology from UAF in the immediate future, but that may change as time goes on. Okay. But you can get the advanced degrees, the masters and the um, PhDs. We had a question from some students who missed the first half of your presentation. Uh, they wanted to know how did the radio song collect the wind velocity um, and could you show us with the, ex the equipment. Um, they were wondering how they keep the data accurately while the equipment is turning and spinning as it goes up. Okay, well the first thing what I probably ought to do, let me go back to this one picture. And first of all I'll show you the device. I'm sorry, I, I gave you a wrong cue there with my assistance here. Um, this is the radio sound again. There's a battery inside that powers this, this transmitter. This is the antenna. So the data is being transmitted out of this antenna to the ground station back at on the Earth. And we can flip just real quick to the PowerPoint. So this is the ground station here. That's the tracking antenna picks it up, the data up, and instantaneously, as soon as it registers a data point, gets to a certain pressure level where there's a significant change in 
in temperature or wind velocity, that's a data point. And then it collects the data and sends it right down into uh, this receiver here, this tracking antenna, that then sends it to a little computer system in a nearby building where it's processed into the final uh, data um, table, which is kind of like what you saw earlier on in the presentation. Now, um, did I really answer the question, though? Was that? I think that's what they were, they were looking okay. for. So it's, it's kind of an instantaneous thing. Um, what is important is that the balloon and the radio sawn goes up at a steady rate in the atmosphere. That I'm talking only about going up right now. Where it goes horizontally as it goes up, that is uh, calculated because the antenna, the tracking antenna, uh, has locks on to this device so it knows the direction this device is traveling. It also has been fed the information or the computer system that's processing this data also has the information about how fast the balloon is rising in the atmosphere. I mentioned that earlier. They put a known amount of helium into the balloon and that means that there's an, what they call an ascent rate that's programmed into the computer. So you know how fast the radio sound is going up and what direction it is going and from that you can calculate wind speed and wind direction, which I think is related to another question I think you talked to me about uh, during our break. So oh, I may yes. have had. Um, that the wind direction showed a 180 degree difference as the balloon went up, is that? No, no that was, the other one? Uh, uh, there was another question that was more how the wind is measured or calculated. Mm -hmm. I think someone asked that, right? Yeah, how does the radio sound collect accurate wind direction? Right, so that's how it goes. The tracking antenna picks up that it knows what direction the radio sound the, and balloon system is moving. So that helps it calculate wind speed and direction. We had another question about um, getting the weather balloons returned to you. Do sometimes they not come back? Or, I mean, to the radio songs, the, the part you put in the mail? Well, we don't really know what the... Um, actually return rate is, it's probably pretty low. I believe it's like on the order of like 7% or so of those launched actually get returned to the facility in Kansas City that I talked about where they're um, uh, refurbished. We had another question. Earlier you mentioned um, uh, that a balloon will go up to 50,000 feet as if it's not, uh, if there aren't any defects. What type of defects could cause a balloon to malfunction? Sometimes the uh, material is just particularly thin in one spot of the balloon, so it bursts maybe early. Um, there is an actual standard uh, threshold set for whereby you, if you don't get up to a certain altitude, or a pressure level actually, if you do not make 400 millibars pressure level, which is about 20 or 21,000 feet up, you do have to go, if you're the one launching the balloon, you do have to go and prepare another balloon with the radio sawn and launch that. Um, and that happens on occasion. Sometimes the uh, instrument itself, this radio sawn, the device in it, the instruments or the transmitter becomes defective on the way up, stops transmitting so you don't have data. Uh, up to 400 millibars or 20, 21,000 feet. So you have to do another launch again right away. And in that case, in either of those cases, the person uh, doing this launch is very, very busy at that point in time because the entire amount of data that's collected has an actual due time of uh, a couple hours after the launch. I think about. Uh, um, 120 minutes or so. I don't know the actual um, due time, but there's some threshold there that has to be met to get this data in. The wind direction changed from zero north to 180 degrees south, then to 200 southeast. And he was talking about the gnome data. Okay. And he wanted to know why, why that had changed. Ah, that's a good uh, question. What that, I guess what we'll do there we go.
Can look at some of the. We'll look at just go back to our basic plot there. Yeah. And yeah, about middle way up, the direction changed from in the lower levels. It was an east or northeast wind, and then it changed to a southerly wind. And that's because there were different features at s different elevations of the atmosphere causing the wind direction. Um, let's take a look at the lower levels. A northeast wind over Nome probably meant there was some type of low pressure over the at the surface near the ground over the southern Bering Sea. And the southerly winds way up uh, from the uh, pressure level 500 on up indicates there was a low pressure center at upper levels of the atmosphere probably almost um, west to northwest of Nome probably quite a ways away at least maybe over the Chukox Peninsula or so and this is interesting because on this day well first of all let's take a look at the lower levels again. Northeast winds, normally winds out of the north, usually uh, typically are cooler or bring cooler air in. Winds out of the south we typically associate with warmer air. So the south winds at upper levels were moving across the cooler air at lower levels and wouldn't you know it on that day there was a little bit of snow going on. So the two different air masses were colliding with each other, at least uh, in the middle levels of the atmosphere, causing a distinct change in the air masses and, and creating uh, snow. And you notice that there is a, um, a marked change where the winds shift there. Uh, it also starts drying out, too. We notice that the temperature and dew point traces I'll put these back on there so you re recall, uh, start uh, separating from each other. Whereas down below, where the winds are out of the east or northeast, um, they're pretty close to one another. So there's a lot of different things happening in the atmosphere at that time, but one of the things that would occurred, which I failed to point out in this presentation, was that there was actually real weather going on. It wasn't a lot of snow. It was uh, very little at this point point in time and maybe because it was also so dry aloft and there was um, a big difference or a bit of separation between the northeasterly winds at lower levels and the strongest of the southerly winds at upper levels. Uh, right now I have one it says Atmos atmosphere have lines like oceans where there are or no clines like ocean where there are thermoclines in the ocean that causes the different pressure areas. Is that a question? Yeah, I think it is a question. The, the atmosphere in some ways is uh, behaves a fair amount like the ocean or the ocean like the atmosphere. Uh, one of the things that are different is the atmosphere is a gas that can be compressed or expanded um, by various forces other than temperature. And the ocean is a substance, a liquid, that is usually is compressed or expanded only by way of temperature variations. Um, but there is a lot of similarities. So you could have a sensor, much like a radiosonde, although it would need to be waterproof, and you could send that downward in the ocean and collect data that was real similar, at least in the temperature. And then they also collect us, instead of humidity, since it's 100% humid, the ocean, a lot of oceanographers collect salinity or how much salt content is in the ocean at any one time. The combinations of temperature and salinity in the ocean help identify a denser or less dense layers of ocean water. Okay, we just got another question about um, the receiving antennas that John was talking about earlier and uh, someone, uh, Ken Stenick and Shishmaref, wanted to know if Nome and Kotzebue would have uh, something similar to that, maybe a smaller version. Right. Actually, um, I'll show you this graphic again that I showed earlier. We just cut, cut away to the screen. And this shows all the locations where the radio sons are launched, and each place does have the same type of receiving facility, the antenna. 
as well as an inflation building. So that includes Kotzebue, includes No, uh, Barrow, McGrath, Fairbanks, Anchorage, Bethel, and so on. Each of those places has this type of facility, um, and I think almost all of them do have the inflation building with two doors, because a lot of these places that may be Fairbanks and McGrath uh, are quite windy at times. Even Fairbanks and McGrath have, have two-door inflation buildings. Well, I had a question then. Um, why exactly do the balloons expand? I remember you saying they get bigger and bigger as they rise. Is it just they fill up with? Well, they're filled up with a certain amount of helium or gas. Yeah. And that stays fixed. I mean, that doesn't change the pressure on the balloon on the inside of the balloon from that gas is always the same but the pressure on the outside of the balloon from the atmosphere decreases as the balloon ascends because pressure goes down or gets less as you go up okay. so now once it gets as it ascends through the atmosphere the helium the pressure of the helium inside the balloon is pushing out the balloon material um, because it's stronger, it's higher than the air pressure that is in the atmosphere outside. So it helps the balloon to expand until a certain point where it just bursts. <laughs> so aside from forecasting, um, how does uh, meteorology benefit the public? Well, um, there's a variety of ways. Of course, the forecasting, the day-to-day -day is Forecasting is only one facet of meteorology. Uh, there's the other facets of research that goes into understanding long-term effects on the atmosphere and, of course, the various various concerns people have today about changing climate. And those issues are all, uh, a lot of it's meteorology-based. It has its, shows up in all kinds of other different sciences as well, though. Um, but the meteorology that we do in the National Weather Service is largely just the day-to-day -day forecasting uh, to help uh, encourage or enhance the ec economy of an area or all across the nation. Uh, so the day-to-day -day forecasts become very important. Um, utility companies like to know when cold snaps are coming, when warm snaps are coming to adjust their their requirements for power or heat generation um, and then there's the short term or or a more hard hitting type of weather that we engage in in forecasting that's the issuances of warnings that help protect uh, life and property that is it's it's those weather events that are on the rare side that can have a big impact on people strong winds, uh, blizzards, um, the uh, freezing rain occurrences, and I mean lots of freezing rain. I know that there's there's numerous times that coastal areas get drizzle, for instance, freezing drizzle, but the uh, heavier freezing rain are important. Um, all kinds of different things, volcanic eruptions, we get involved with that, especially our, our offices in Anchorage do, and uh, in Juneau and um, various other things. There's uh, aircraft uh, forecasts that we make here, not only in Fairbanks, but uh, forecasts out of Anchorage for airfields, I should say, not specific aircraft, but for being able to land and take off at all these places, Barrow, Cotsview, Nome, Fairbanks, uh, Bettles, uh, Bethel, McGrath, Galena, all these places have forecasts of the airfield conditions. So there's a variety of ways that we come to play with the general public. I should also mention too, uh, mariners, those who get in their boats and go out to sea. We have marine forecasts that help them to um, plan their day and to we provide warnings in the marine venue as well so that they know when hazardous weather may be affecting them in their boat. And how do you give out warnings on the, is there a, what system is in place for that? Well, there's a couple of ways. First of all, in the regular forecasts that are issued each day, um, each segment of the forecast, we have the state divided, or our area, divided into a number of different what we call zones. In the lower 48, at least in the eastern half, those zones are all 
almost always uh, the county that person lives in. But as you know, in Alaska, we don't have counties or boroughs everywhere. But we've created various zones that try to represent, in general, some climate similarity. And we issue warnings in the in the product. In the uh, if you go to our website and look at at the different um, uh, listing for each zone, the forecast may have a headline at the top of the of its body that tells about the hazardous weather that would be coming when we issue a watch or a warning or an advisory for these hard-hitting weather conditions. Um, in various locations, mainly the bigger communities, Barrow and Kotzebue, Nome and Fairbanks, I believe also in Bethel, certainly in Anchorage and Valdez, in Juneau, and several other cities, Cold Bay, probably Kodiak. We also have a system, and a radio system called NOAA Weather Radio, that will transmit these warnings on a radio signal that you can pick up either on the weather band and if you have a multi-band radio or you can buy a special receiver that will pick up this radio broadcast you can buy certain units certain receivers that will just come on when a warning is issued for instance so that you will know ahead of time uh, what the uh, severe weather that's coming will be I have one thing too, I forgot to mention this, I was going to say at the very beginning. We do appreciate the data of weather instruments that are, are mounted on the various schools out in the Bering Strait School District. We look at that daily in our forecast operations as well as the other uh, weather service and FAA uh, weather systems that are out there on the surface of, uh, of western Alaska. Um, well, I guess, I guess that's it for today for okay. Mentor Lecture number three. And we would, uh, once again, like to thank John Lingus very, very much for his participation. And again, for those of you who weren't able to join us today, we will have a DVD available for you shortly.